Praise the Lord. All right, so as we pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the service today. Thank you for your people. Thank you for our children, for our youths, and all our students on the campus, and the fathers and the mothers who are here today. With all our young people, to Lord, we pray. You bless every one of us together in this service today in Jesus' name. And we pray that as your voice reaches everyone, we'll answer yes in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that as we answer and we do what you call us to do, we pray that the blessing will be upon the work in our hand and upon our personal lives and upon everything we do in Jesus' name. Amen. Open our eyes to see what you want us to see and open our ears to hear your word as you want us to hear and the answer will be positive and your blessings will multiply in every life in jesus name we thank you because we know you have answered in jesus name we pray we're talking about god's call in our lives today god's call to everyone he calls every one of us number one he calls us to salvation Number two, he calls us to separation. That is, he wants us to separate from our old life, past life, sinful life, and come unto him in righteousness and holiness. Number three, he calls us to his own service. He wants us to serve him. Every time he calls anyone to salvation and separation, what normally follows is that he wants us to come into the service of the Lord. Judges chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 12. Judges 6 verse 12, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, and said unto him, and said unto him, it was a personal call, it was a pointed call, and it was a peculiar call. This was coming to Gideon, it was coming to him directly. When the Lord calls us, there's no missing of the words, and there's no doubt about or dilly-dallying about it, he calls us specifically and he calls us specially and he calls us to a very definite service he said that the lord is with thee thou mighty man of valor thou mighty man of valor god doesn't see us the way we are or the way we were he sees us as the way we will be when he calls us he's not looking at our present condition present situation present circumstances he's not looking at even our fears and misgivings he says you're the man of valor he says you're a mighty man of valor as you look at the practical side of the life of gideon you'll know that he was not feeling mighty he was not feeling great he was not feeling unconquerable or invincible he felt he couldn't do anything that's why as we read the story of gideon you'll find all the things he tried to do to dodge the call of god and if god says you are mighty you are mighty in jesus name that's why the word of god says let the weak say i am strong and that strength of the Lord will be upon every life. He says, the Lord is with me, the mighty man of valor. Look at that verse again. If the Lord is with you, he is mighty, he is strong, he is unconquerable. And if he is with you, with all his strength, and he's going to support you underneath the everlasting arms, that makes you mighty. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, it says, and the Lord looked upon him. The Lord looked upon him. You see, when the Lord forgives us, all our sins are forgiven and forgotten. And he looks at us now, and he's not seeing us as wretched sinners, as doubting sinners, and miserable sinners. He looked upon him, and what did he say? He said, go in this thy might. Go in this thy might. That takes faith on our side. You know who you were. You know what you were. You were a sinner. You were weak. You're always shielded to temptation. And now you gave your life to the Lord Jesus Christ to become a child of God. And then you're still looking at yourself the way you were. I'm not strong. I'm weak. And even some people even continue to say, I am a sinner saved by grace. No, you are not. You're a saint of God. He calls you saint. He calls you mighty. He calls you his child. In that verse 14, go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent thee? The same thing that God told Joshua. Have I not commanded you? Have I not sent you? The same thing he was telling this 
man, Gideon. And I pray that when the word of God comes to us, we'll think of ourselves the way God is thinking about us. We'll say of ourselves what the Lord is saying about us in Jesus' name. Look at verse 16. It says, And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. If you had seen Gideon where he was before this time, he was trying to thresh some wheat. But he did that in a secluded place. Instead of going to the mountain top to do that, so that the wind would blow the chaff away, he hid himself from the Midianites. And see this man hiding away from Midianites. The Lord now said, you are the one, you are fearful of the Midianites. Midianites, you're afraid of the Midianites and you're kind of checking away, you're, you're keeping a great distance between you and the Midianites I'm going to get you near them and you're going to destroy them as one single man. Look at verse 22 in verse 22 and when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said alas, O Lord Gideon God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face, and the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. I will not die. What the Lord has committed into Gideon's hand, he will do before death came. And what the Lord has committed into your hand, you will do before death comes in Jesus' name. He saw the angel. And when he saw the angel, his own interpretation of seeing the angel is that I'm going to die. I've seen an angel. I've seen the heavenly representative of the Lord himself. You see, there are some people, the tradition that people have, the ideas that people have in the old life. You know, when you see God, you die when you see the angel of God you die he was still having that that's why when new converts are made many of the new converts they still have the old tradition the old principles and the old superstition and the old things they thought about their lives but now when they come that's why we teach them that's why Jesus said they're going to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and then when they become converts you want to disciple them you want them to know that all the old ideologies and the old tradition, the old superstition they had, all that was wrong. And you give them assurance because you're a new creature now, you have new knowledge and new understanding and new approach and new outlook to life. Verse 23 says, and the Lord said unto him, peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Then verse 24, and then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. Jehovah Shalom is one of the seven covenant names of the Lord in the Old Testament. This is Jehovah, the Lord, our peace. The Lord, our peace. He had the peace of God. What does the Bible say? Being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Once you come to the Lord in repentance, and then your sins are forgiven. You are saved, you are born again, you are a child of God. Now you have the peace of God being justified by faith. And then it becomes the Lord, your peace, Jehovah Shalom. Unto this day, it is yet in Ophrah of the Abyssalites. And so you will find the call of God upon Gideon. It was a divine call to service, a divine call to leadership, and a divine call to national deliverance. It was to deliver the whole nation from the Midianites. It was a divine call to defeat the oppressive nation that is the Midianites, troubling them, oppressing them, and it was a divine call to national transformation and triumph. It was a difficult time for Israel. And look at Judges chapter 6 and look at the condition and the situation of the Israelites at that time. When the Lord calls us, it might not be the easiest of times. You know, when times go well and when things go go easy, then I, I respond to the call of God, not at all. Chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 1, and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Midianites. How many years? Seven years. As you look at the children of Israel at this time, there's what we call a cycle. And then for them, it was a vicious cycle, a negative cycle. It was a terrible cycle on them. Number one, there was sin. 
Number two, there was supplication. Number three, there was salvation. And then again, there was, uh, you know, going back into their evil ways, into their sin. As we come to chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, chapter five, chapter six, and then you go on to chapter nine, you go on to the rest of the judges, you find that cycle repeating again. One sin. They committed sin before the Lord. Because of that sin, the Lord laid punishment upon them too. You have suffering. And because of that suffering, they cry unto the Lord. Then you have supplication. Then because of that uh, supplication, you have salvation, redemption, that the Lord redeemed them again. And then they'll start all over again, sin and suffering and supplication. And then salvation. After that salvation, after a few years again, they go back again into sin and then suffering will come. And then supplication and salvation again, a vicious cycle in their lives. I hope that is not in your own life, that you are learning by the stick. You are learning by the rod. You are not learning by the word that once the word of the Lord has come to you, he has delivered you. He has saved you. He has redeemed you from the hand of the enemy. You don't begin that cycle in your life again and go back to where you came from. I pray that God will keep us steady and stable, solid all the days of our lives in Jesus name. In verse 2, we are told the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel and because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them uh, the dens uh, which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was in verse 3. When Israel had sown and the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east and even they came up against them and they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza and left no sustainers for Israel neither sheep nor ox nor ass for they came up with their cattle and their tents and they came as grasshoppers for multitude they covered the whole land if you know what grasshoppers do, they eat up all the green things, all the vegetables and everything they can just get to. And they came like grasshoppers for multitude, for both they and their camels were without number. And they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. It was their cry to the Lord that brought Gideon into the open because God now came to him and said, I have an assignment for you. The nation had sunk into deep idolatry and deep suffering. His call could only be fulfilled by faith. The same thing the Lord is calling us today. And when the call of God comes to us, we understand we're going to respond by faith. To say yes to the Lord, when the answer comes, we can only fulfill that yes and that response to the call of God just by faith. That's why we're looking at fulfilling God's call by faith in his sufficiency. Faith in his sufficiency. Not faith in your own humanness. Not faith in your own wisdom. Not faith in your own power. Not faith in your own natural abilities. Not faith in your own human might. It is faith in God's sufficiency. And this is what God required and requested from Gideon. The Lord said, I'm with you. That mighty man of valor. I make you mighty. The presence of the Lord in our lives makes us mighty. Fulfilling God's call by faith in his sufficiency you'll fulfill God's call no matter how weak you think you are no matter how ignorant you think you are all the other people he called before you and the people is going to call after you were just the same when God called Moses, Moses said me can I do it? Call another man and when God called other people the same thing they felt even though you feel weak the strength of the Lord will make you mighty in Jesus name fulfilling God's call by faith in his sufficiency. Three things to consider. Number one, a clear assignment demanding great faithfulness. A clear assignment demanding great faithfulness. When God calls us, he gives us a clear assignment. He says, 
this is the way to go. Don't turn to the right, don't turn to the left. That is the way to go. A clear assignment demanding great faithfulness. Number two, a complete assurance developing growing faith. A complete assurance developing growing faith. When God gives us assurance, he gives us this item to give us assurance. Your faith will grow a little bit more. Another assurance of faith ought to grow a little bit more. Another assurance the faith ought to grow a little bit more. That's what God wanted Gideon to realize. Number three, a Christian's assessment concerning discerning Gideon's fleas. That is a Christian's assessment. You see, when we read the Old Testament, we need to assess them. We need to evaluate them. We need to examine them. We need to test them. You test them by the word of the Lord to the New Testament believers. For example, here is uh, Moses. And see what Moses did. Well, because Moses was a great man, are we going to justify everything he did? God said, go speak to that rock. And then he spun the rock two times. Water still came out. And millions of people still drank water. But a Christian will assess that. A Christian will examine that. Is that the right thing to do? Here is Joshua. A great man. A good man indeed. And then the Gibeonites came. And they said we're coming from a far country. And look at our clothes. Our clothes already they are worn out. Because of our long journey. And Joshua did not ask from the Lord. Are these people telling the truth or not? He made a league with them. He made an agreement with them three days after he then discovered that these people came from nearby what a great mistake he made a christian will assess that a christian will think about that here is something one of the judges in israel in the book of the judges and you know began to love a woman among the philistines and then the parents challenge said no pleases me well that's one i'm going to marry him and eventually Lala made that man to tell all that he knew about himself and the Philistines came upon him and removed his two eyes. We examine, we say, these men of the Bible, is this the way we ought to go? And so that's the reason why you look at Gideon, put a fleece there, and put this there, and then said this and that. You don't just take that and say, that's a great man of God. There's the Christian's assessment discerning Gideon's fleece. I come to point number one. That is a, a clear assignment demanding great faithfulness. Let's see the assignment the Lord has given. We're looking at uh, this chapter 6 again of Judges chapter 6. And I'm reading from verse 14. Judges chapter 6, verse 14. Clear assignment. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, for thou shalt save Israel from the Midianites. Clear assignment, you are to save the nation, the people of Israel from the Midianites. That's number one assignment. What's the assignment the Lord has given to us? Is the assignment the Lord gave to Jesus Christ. And what he gave to Jesus Christ, Christ has given to the church. What assignment is that? We're looking at Matthew chapter 1. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. Here is the assignment the Lord has given to his only begotten son. And this is that assignment the Lord has passed on to his own followers to his own disciples and she shall bring forth his son and thou shalt call his name jesus for he shall save he shall save his people not from the midianites now not from the amalekites now not from this or that will save them from their sins in john chapter 17 john chapter 17 i'm reading from verse 18 john chapter 17 we're looking at verse 18 see the assignment he has given to gideon and see the assignment he has given to christ and see the assignment he has now given to you a member of the church a child of god as thou hast sent me into the world even so have i also sent them into the world even so have i also sent them into the world the Father sent the Son to save us from sin. And now we are saved. After we are saved, He passes on that assignment unto us. And it's very clear. There's no other thing we're doing here but to save the people from their sins. We tell them this is the way of the Lord, the way of repentance, and the way of righteousness, the way of restitution. They come out of their sins. They believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and they are saved. What a great assignment. Come back to Judges chapter 6. We're looking Looking at verse 16, Judges chapter 6, and we're looking at verse 16. The clear assignment given to him 
and the clear assignment given unto us. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. Thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. The word smite there is to destroy. Destroy their power. Destroy their stronghold. Destroy their confidence. And destroy their hold on the people of Israel. Understand that thou shalt smite them as one man. And you look at what the Father had given to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're looking at First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3. And we're reading here from verse 8. First John chapter 3, we're reading from verse 8. We have something to destroy as well. It tells us in chapter 3 verse 8, He that committed sin is of the devil. You will not be of the devil in Jesus' name. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, for this reason, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. That's what the Lord has given us to do now. We're to destroy the works of the devil. It was given to Gideon, smite them, destroy them, get rid of them. It has been given to us too because of Jesus Christ that we're also to destroy all those works of the devil. We're coming back to chapter 6 of Judges. Chapter 6 of Judges is in verse 25 now. Here is what the Lord was telling Gideon in verse 25 of Judges chapter 6. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, the Lord said unto him, it's not just something that Gideon said, I feel like doing this. I think this is what I want to do. I think I'm making my plans. I will do this. I will do that. It's what the Lord said. Concentrate on that. There are many people that do what the Lord has not said. They put all their energy. They put all their resources. They put all their money. They put everything, their time, their skill into something the Lord has not commanded. And if you do what God has not commanded, even if you succeed in doing it, there's no reward for that on earth or in heaven. But you'll find out what has the Lord said. And this was what Gideon should find out. What has the Lord commanded me to do? As you look at a Gideon, you see a number of things he did that, you know, God did not command that. And Gideon should just have concentrated. This is what the Lord said. He was speaking to, you know, these uh, people. He said, uh, can you give uh, my people Paul bread, you find that in chapter 8, and he said, Oh, we're going to give you bread at the hands of the Philistines in your hand. Have you overcome yet? It's all right. When I come back, I'm going to tear your flesh with the sons. Now, God did not tell him to do that, he just did that by himself. And when he did that, he did that with zeal and with passion, he did that with real seriousness. And that is one thing the Lord had not commanded him to do. You see, there are many people they concentrate their energy, God didn't say do that find out the assignment that is very clear what the lord had said to be done look at that verse 25 judges chapter 6 and it came to pass the same night that the lord said unto him take thy father's young bullock and even the second bullock and is of seven years old have you noticed seven years they had been oppressed seven years by the Midianites and this uh, sacrifice this bullock had been there for those same seven years so bring an end to seven years of oppression that same bullock that is seven years will take that and you're going to sacrifice that it was very definite and specific and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father has and cut down the grove that is by it. He told him what to throw down. He told him what to cut down. Look at Je Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. Uh, we need to find out what's the Lord telling us to do. What has the Lord told uh, this Gideon to do? And then as you look at the way he did it, you look at the way you ought to do yours as well, but make sure you concentrate on what he has called you to do. Here, for example, you're a local pastor right now in that location church. What what has the Lord told you to do? They're very clear. You want souls to the Lord and then you disciple them and you baptize them in water when they are born again and then you are teaching them the word of God. And the other things you are doing, you are putting all your energy into that the Lord has not called you to do. Look at the women ministry. What has the Lord called their women to do in the women ministry? Find that out. Or are you concentrating on other things that are not bringing souls into the kingdom of God? We're looking at our youth ministry and thank God for the great revival we're having among the youth and the program we're having this week starting on Tuesday is going to be a success camp. 
I said, it's going to be a success camp. And, you know, I've heard of, you know, the, the young people are going out, inviting other people, and they're making publicity, and it's going to be a great time indeed in Jesus' name. But all our leaders then understanding, this is what the Lord has given us to do in the youth section, and we concentrate on that. Other things the Lord has not given us to do, we just say, well, that's not my duty, that's not my responsibility. Look at Jeremiah chapter 1, and we're looking at verse 10. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down and to build and to plant over the nations. All those nations having idolatry, all those nations serving a bear or serving an evil spirit or serving whatever and having wrong covenant and negative covenant, evil covenant, I've sent you there to throw down all those works of the devil. And when you know what God has called you to do. That's exactly what you do. You don't deviate right or left. We're looking at Second Corinthians chapter 10. Second Corinthians chapter 10. I hope you'll concentrate. And I thank the Lord. Uh, you know, our, our brother, our leader was, uh, you know, leading the prayer. He said, we well, thank the Lord for the uniformity of the word of God in the whole church. And that is something we have to thank the Lord about because the whole church, all the location churches, all the group churches, and all the regional churches, Churches concentrating on the same thing. We know that this is our call, and it is that uniformity and that unity that is helping us uh, to have all the revival we're having everywhere. And I pray to continue in Jesus' name that nobody will, you know, privately begin to do something that the calling of God has not, uh, you know, put upon us. In Second Corinthians chapter ten, I was reading from verses four and five. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. That's our calling. That's our calling. Our calling is not to the Midianites today. Our calling is not to the Amalekites today. Our calling is not to all those men of the East that joined with the uh, Midianites in the time of Gideon. Ours is very clear as well that there are strongholds of the devil. There are strongholds of immorality. There are strongholds of sin. There are strongholds of unrighteousness. There are strongholds of deception and false doctrine and he has called us to pull them down they will pull them down in Jesus name look at verse 5 casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God the knowledge of God is the doctrine of the Bible we know the doctrines of the Bible what the Lord has taught us from cover to cover in the Bible and anything any imagination any ideology any kind of a philosophy any superstition that is fighting against against that doctrine of the word of God in our preaching we pull them down in our prayer we pull them down in our church administration church organization we pull them down that is what the Lord has given us to do we're very watchful we're very vigilant and we're looking at everything is is there anything there is there any tradition there is there any kind of a worldly a system trying to come in there that will drag down that will be contradicting the the knowledge of God in our midst will bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, you will do it. I will do it. We will unite together to do it in Jesus' name. We're coming back. We're coming back now to uh, Judges chapter 6. You see, it was a clear thing the Lord called the Gideon to do. Judges chapter 6. And I'm reading from verse 26. In verse 26, it says, And build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of the rock. Here the Lord was still talking to, was still talking to Gideon. He said, This is what to do. Number one, you save Israel from the Midianites. Number two, you also destroy, you smite the Midianites as one man. Number three, you throw down, you cut down all the groves and all those idolatrous things. Number four, you build unto the Lord. Build unto the Lord. Build unto the Lord. And that's what the Lord is telling us to do. You know, Jesus himself said, upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church that Christ is building in Jesus' name. And thank God you are part of that church. And the gates of hell cannot prevail against you. 
as a single brother, single sister, married brother, married sister, as a youth, you're a member of the body of Christ, and you're part of the church. Christ is building the gates of hell, no matter what direction they are coming from, they will not overcome you in Jesus' name. We're to build your life and build that life on the basis of the word of God. Look at the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 32. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 32. As we build what the Lord has given us to build, he says, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. That's why preaching is so central in the ministry of the church. Preaching is so central, even in the house fellowship, and preaching is so central in our revival third week of the month uh, program. Anything we're doing, preaching is uh, very central. Why? Because it's through the preaching of the world. We build up the believers. We build up the young. We build, even in the children church, we build build them up on the basis of the word of God. It will build you up and give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. Will be saved and sanctified in Jesus' name. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 we're builders. You'll be a builder. And what you build will not collapse. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I'm reading here from verse 9, for we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. Ye are God's building. You see, it's giving us a clear assignment of what we're to do. And it says that we are to build in verse 10, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me. As a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. We're building, whether you, you know, you are in this area of work, you're building together with us. So in this other area, we're building together. There's no contradiction. There's no competition. Our pastors, our men, they're preaching. Our wives, our, our women leaders, they're also supporting and they're building. And then our choir, they're singing. Our ushers, secret, everybody, we're, we're doing it together. And our youth section, children's section, we're all building together. You'll not say, well, this is not important. Everything we do is important because everything is part of the building. The apostle door as a master builder, he has laid the foundation and the rest of us were building upon that foundation for the foundation in verse 11 can no man lay than that is laid with a Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, uh, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try, shall test every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, your work will abide which he has built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Your work will be rewardable in Jesus' name. Then in verse 15, if any man's work shall be burnt, those who bid wood, hay, stubble, they're working to you, they're striving to you, they're struggling to you, they're helping to you. You be part of the work to you, only that the materials they're using, those materials, they're not poisonous, they're not negative, but they're worthless. There's no value in them. They're using wood or hay or stubble. And then it says it shall be burnt, that is the work shall be burnt. If any man's work shall be burnt, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved so as by fire. That means that if he still lives a righteous life, is saved, is a real child of God, only that the work was worthless. The work did not contribute anything to the progress of the church and to the salvation of souls. He says, well, he will be saved on the basis of his personal life. But the work he has done, everything will be lost for all eternity. I pray that will not be your Lord. In verse 16, know ye not? that ye are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. These are people now, they say they are building with us but they're like the Jezebel in the church in Tatira. They're negative. 
They make people to commit sin. They lead people into sin. They're like a Balaam. And the people teaching the doctrines and the, and they do something collators and they do something negative and make people to go back into sin to idolatry. It says, if any man like Balaam, anyone like Jezebel defiled the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. I pray that our work will be positive and not negative in Jesus' name. We're coming back to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. And we're looking at, uh, we're looking at verse uh, 26. As we look at what uh, this Gideon was to do. Number one, you see there was destruction. Destruction. There was something he was to destroy. And then you look at your own work to you. Destruction. You come to a local church and see the tradition there. You see the superstition there. You see some idolatrous practices coming in. Like when they want to do naming ceremony, they want to do wedding, they want to do reception, or they want to do some other things. And then you see that among the young people, they are saying covenant, covenant, and we say which covenant is this? They are introducing the idolatrous things. And then there is destruction. Number two, there is construction. Construction. After putting down this and casting down this, then there's a building up, which is construction. And then there's obstruction. Obstruction is, you know, when he, dis when he destroyed all those idolatrous things, then the people of the city came and they said, no, who has done this one? How can this be done? Bring the man out. When they realized it was a Gideon, we're going to kill him. It was obstruction against the work the Lord had given him to do. And then the father said, who is going to defend Baal? If any man is going to defend Baal, then let him die the death. If Baal is God, let him defend himself. And then he passed over that obstruction. Now he had instruction, instruction. And the Lord now began to give him instruction as to what he will do. The spirit of God came upon him and then he had this instruction. You'll find those four elements in the calling that God has given us. Number one, destruction. You look at your life, you look at your family and say this will not go, that will not go. There must be that destruction. Then number two, there'll be the construction. You begin to build up. You build yourself in the faith. You build on the word of God. You build yourself in the love of God. You build the church as well. Then there's obstruction. Persecution might come they say, hey, how did you do that? Why should you do that? They want to obstruct your way. They want to hinder you from getting to where you will go. You will get there in Jesus' name. And then instruction comes in your life. The Lord begins to say, this is what to do, and that's what to do, and that's what to do. And then as you follow the instructions of the Lord, you are going to overcome in Jesus' name. Now, the next thing the Lord told Gideon, he was to offer a sacrifice. Look at this in chapter 6 of verse 26. Judges chapter 6, verse 26 and build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock and in the ordered place and take the second bullock and offer a bond sacrifice of the wood of the grove which thou hast caught now offer a sacrifice isn't that what the Lord has told us as well that we need to offer a sacrifice what kind of sacrifice is that we're looking at Romans chapter 12 Romans chapter 12 these things are written for our learning for our munition upon whom the ends of the world are come. As we read all these things in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, there is something for you. Then you think, how does that apply to the Christian? How does that apply to a New Testament disciple? If God told them to do this, what is the similar thing he has called me to do? In Romans chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies. Now you are not offering a bullock now of seven years old. You are presenting your very body. You present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. Let all the superstitions go. Let all the traditions go. Let all those idolatrous practices go. And be not conformed unto this world but be thou renewed, be renewed, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. 
God. We'll present all that unto the Lord. Our assignment is very clear. Our assignment is very definite. It's very specific. As children of God go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, you'll make a success of the ministry in Jesus' name. Now, point number two is a complete assurance, developing growing faith. Complete assurance, developing growing faith. The Lord was calling Gideon, and the Gideon had no excuse, actually, because we have been told in the word of God, in the little they had of the Bible revealed at that time that they were to take the old testament that they had that's the genesis to deuteronomy already that was written at that time because moses wrote them and moses left there with the children of israel anybody got called to lead the people should take that and read through that and then follow after that's what joshua did look at the leadership of joshua see how joshua uh, led the children of israel at his own time and he provided a good and perfect example for them we're looking at uh, joshua chapter 11 Joshua chapter 11 verse 15 it tells us as the Lord commanded Moses his servant so did Moses command Joshua and so did Joshua he left nothing undone of all that the Lord had commanded Moses that was the victory of Joshua that was the wisdom of Joshua that was the triumph of Joshua because he did everything as the Lord had commanded and what Gideon should have done is also check up that word and do everything according to the word of the Lord. Well, Gideon is gone, but you are there. What you should do is take the word of God and then do as the Lord has commanded. You'll do like that in Jesus' name. We're coming to, we're coming to Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17. And I'm reading from verse 14. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 14. When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee and shall possess it and shall dwell therein and shall say I will set a king over me like all the nations which are about me. The Lord knew that they will need leadership. At this time now there was no king in Israel and everyone did that which was right in his own eyes. They shouldn't have done that. They should just go back to the word of God that when you get to the land and you possess that and you dwell in that land here is what you'll do. Verse 15 that Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. God chose Gideon, and he chose him to rule over the people and to deliver the people. Then he says, one from among thy brethren, and that was a Gideon. He was the one among them, and shalt thou say to be king, to be leader, to be ruler over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not of thy brethren. It's very clear. You're not set a stranger over you. There's a local church there, and then you are the pastor there. When you are chosen as the pastor there because you are not a stranger. You're not a stranger to salvation. You're not a stranger to this church. You're not a stranger to the doctrines and the teaching of the word of God in the church. If you are not around, maybe you want to go somewhere, and then you want to put somebody there. There are other people there in the church, among the leaders, among the workers in that local church, who are not strangers. Those are the people people you put there but you know some people who don't know the word of God and they say well these people I don't want them to take my place after I'm gone therefore they bring a stranger somewhere and put it on them that a stranger is not the right person you see the word of God in verse 16 it says but he shall not multiply or cease to himself now cause the people to return to Egypt. That's what the leader will do. This is what Gideon should have read. And to the end that he shall multiply horses for as much as the Lord has said unto you. He shall henceforth return no more that way. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself. Oh, why didn't Gideon read this? That he wanted them, those kings and those leaders and those rulers who have just one wife. is not multiply wives to himself. That his such turn not away, neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold and it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, he shall write him a copy of this law in the book, out of that which is before the priests and the Levites the Levites were still there, the ark of the covenant was still there, the word of God was still there, he will write everything out and it shall be, in verse 19 with him, and it 
shall read therein all the days of his life. If the book of Judges had done this, everybody will not be doing just what is right in their own eyes. They'll keep to that word of God. And then it says that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and to keep all in the words of this law and these statutes and to do them that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom he and his children in the midst of Israel well if those uh, people failed we will not fail I said, we will not fail. We don't even have to go to the kind of ordeal of copying out the Bible today because there's printing press. And, uh, you know, Bible society, they have printed all these Bibles. And every one of us now, you can get a copy of the Bible. And then instead of, you know, spending the time to write it out, and the Bible is now available. The audio is available. The reaching script is available. It's on the iPad. It's on the phone. It's everywhere. It's on the laptop. It's on the computer. It's also in the Bible we hold in our hand. We don't have any excuse today. We can read it every day. We'll read it in Jesus name. And then we go by the words that the Lord himself has taught us. Let's see that uh, Gideon did not have any excuse because God gave him complete assurance that should develop growing faith. Well, number one, assurance, the word of promise. The word of promise. We're looking at Judges chapter 6 and verse 12 again. Judges chapter 6, we're looking at verse 12 again. Look at the word of promise and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him the Lord is with thee thou mighty man of valor the Lord is with thee isn't that what the Lord has told us that the Lord is with us and we are the mighty people of today you are the mighty man of valor mighty woman of valor in Jesus name look at verse 16 here in verse 16 it says the Lord said unto him surely I will be with thee and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man that's the word of promise and that's enough to give him the faith that he needed and you know there are some people that are running after revelation, running after vision, running after this and that. The word is not sufficient for them. And they think, you know, some people, they say, I heard of a particular tape. I heard of a particular CD. In that CD, somebody said she went to heaven and when that person got to heaven and saw, you know, the people in heaven, the way they dress, they dress like deeper life and then those uh, people, they told me over there, go and tell them back in the world that, you know, if you dress like deeper life, even if you are not sanctified, if you dress like deeper life, even though you are married to the second husband, if you dress like deeper life, just dressing, dressing, dress like that, then you will go to heaven. And then some people are, have you heard, have you heard, have you seen? They say that if you dress like deeper life, finish. Whether you are still stealing or not, just dress like that, that's finished. And whether you have done restitution or not, you are stealing uh, money from your place of work, God doesn't look at that, only dress like deeper life. And then some people said, look at this one, that, you know, they recommend deeper life from heaven. Uh -uh. You follow the word of God. I said we follow the word of God and then some people that have not even you know following the word of God will be teaching the Bible and teaching the Bible they are adamant they are resistant they are rebellious saying me never and then somebody said go and listen to this and because somebody now said that she died and all that and this is ah I didn't know now I'm going to do this and then they say look at me now I'm dressing like deeper life I'm going to heaven have you repented have you given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ? How about the anger in the heart? Dressing? Dressing is not enough. How about all the stealing? How about all the jealousy? How about all the envy? All that is not enough. If you have that thing, you'll throw it away in Jesus' name. You know, all these lies that people come to, these are the last days. These are the last days. You remember that Jesus himself told the story of Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man died and went to hell. And then in hell, he took the signs and they said, I'm in torment in this, a flame of fire and then Lazarus also died he was carried by angels into the bosom of Abraham and then the rich man said send Lazarus that he will come over and dip his son in water and cool my 
my tongue because I'm tormented in this flame. And Abraham said, no, that's not possible. There's a great gulf between us and, and Lazarus cannot come over. You'll be there forever and ever. All right, Abraham, do one favor unto me that you will send Lazarus where? To my brethren and when you send them let lazarus tell them that he saw me here let us also tell them he saw this one he saw this one and abraham said it's not possible once you are over there you are over there they have tell me moses and the prophets the word of god let them hear them if they don't hear them it says that they will also come into this place when Lazarus died, I mean the last of John chapter 11, he spent four days in the great beyond and when he came back, he didn't take over from the words of Jesus Jesus was still preaching to the people and the people were following the preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ they didn't follow, you know, Lazarus died and Lazarus is telling us he saw this person there, that person went to hell, he saw that church that church, they are not preaching the right thing they went to hell and then Lazarus said he saw deeper life there, if you want to go to heaven everybody now come let's go to heaven through a deeper life Lazarus did not say that he did not mention a word of what he said when he went to the great beyond it's only the word of God Jesus said if you continue in my word then are ye my disciples indeed it's not continuing watching all those people are saying and then we know about Paul the apostles right they went to the third heaven and he was in paradise and he saw things and had things that cannot be uttered he didn't come to tell us that all he told us is the word of jesus the word of the lord the gospel it is the gospel that takes us to heaven it is the word of god that takes us to heaven it's not one cd there one cd there one cd there that's deception look at you know the damsel that was following paul and silas these are the great men of god that show unto us the way of salvation and then paul did not say oh come on let's record that in the cd and then we distribute that so that the people will know we are the men of god that lady is giving us recommendation that lady is saying that we are the great people people of God and were shown the word of salvation. Paul the apostle said that evil spirit come out in Jesus name it came out. And all these evil spirits that are traveling here and there, they died, they saw this and that. How do you know that they actually died? How do you know that they are not making up those stories? Have you seen them? Do you know their lives and the men they are following that they are following about? What do you know they are doing among themselves? Be very careful. The word of God is sufficient for us. I said the Bible is sufficient for us. We don't need recommendation of anybody to come and tell us, I saw mommy so-and-so in heaven, and Jesus said, go and tell them, let them dress as mommy so-and-so. You will not follow the devil. You will not follow evil spirit. You will follow the word of God in Jesus' name. We're looking at Second Peter, Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. I'm reading to you here from verse, from verse 16. Second Peter chapter 1 and we're looking at him from verse 16 it says for we have not followed kindly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and because we were eyewitnesses of his majesty that is uh, Peter James and John they went to the Mount of Transfiguration they saw Jesus Christ transfigured and they saw Moses and they saw Elijah it says for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased and this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount but it says we have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day a star arise in your hearts. And this is Peter saying, well, we're there on the Mount of Transfiguration. But he says, that's not what we're going to major on. We have a more sure word of prophecy. And this word, the Bible, God has given us, we're going to keep on proclaiming it in Jesus' name. The word of promise. That's how faith comes. That's how faith comes. Look at Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Romans chapter 10, we're looking at verse 17. Romans chapter 10, we're looking at verse 17. And it says in verse 17, it says, Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the vision. 
Hearing by the revelation of somebody who died and came back. What does it say? Hearing by the word of God. That word is in your hand. I said it's in your hand. What is the word of God in your hand? That's it. That's it. Trace it up. That's it. Trace it up. That's enough. Look at all this. You have this and you are running after another. So you are wasting your money. You are wasting God's money. Listen to this. Read this one. Read this one. This is the most sure word of prophecy. It will be fulfilled every letter and every jot, every title in Jesus' name. Now, number two is the accepted sacrifice. Accepted sacrifice. Don't you see what Gideon did? Well, coming back to, we're coming back to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. I'm reading here from verse 17. Judges chapter 6. We're reading from verse 17. Gideon should have known that already God accepted the sacrifice. In chapter 6, verse 17 it says, And he said unto him, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee, and bring forth my present, and set it before thee. And, and he said, I will tarry until thou come again. And Gideon went in and made ready a kid and um, living case of an ephah of flour and the flesh of he put in a basket and he put the broth in a pot and brought it out unto him under the oak and presented it and the angel of God said unto him take the flesh and the unleavened cakes and, and lay them upon the rock and pour out the broth and he did so and the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes and there rose a fire out of the rock, this supernatural fire out of the rock, and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. That should build his faith because he made the sacrifice, and the sacrifice was accepted by the evidence of fire coming out of that rock. That's the fire coming out of the rock, the rock of ages. And because of that, the man shall say, Praise the Lord. Number one, I had the word of promise. Number two, you, I have the accepted sacrifice. Number three, the Lord our peace. Look at this in Judges chapter 6 and verse 24. Judges chapter 6 verse 24 it says, Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. Unto this day it is yet in Ophrah of the Abiezerites. That means that the Lord is with us and the Lord is our peace. Since the Lord is our peace, that alone should convince him. Look at this number four is divine defense. Divine Divine defense. Look at uh, chapter 6 and verse 13. In verse 30, it says, Then the men of the city said unto Josh, that's his father, bring out thy son, that he may die because he has cast down the altar of Baal, and because he has cut down the grove that was by it. Gideon knew that the people actually, once they said they were going to kill him, his father should have said, Now you see what you've done, you see what you brought upon yourself. The father should not have defended him because it was the father that had the idol. It was a father that was worshipping that idol. And then Gideon took that in the night and destroyed everything without even informing the father. And look at what happened in verse 31. And Judge said unto all that stood against him, will ye plead for Baal? Will ye save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death while it is yet morning. For if he be a god, let him plead for himself because one has cast now is altered. Therefore, on that day he called him Jeroboam, saying, Let Baal plead against him because he has thrown down his altar. Look at that divine defense. It was the Lord defending Gideon himself. All that should have built up his faith. God gave him complete assurance that should develop his faith. And with all that we're hearing, God has given us assurance. I said, God has given us assurance. Number one, look at your own salvation. You repented of sin, then you were born again, and then you became a new creature in Christ. The things you were not able to do before, now you are able to do them. And you are able to stand with a strong backbone, defending the word of God. You stood in persecution. The Lord stayed with you. And then we are here when you are hearing the word of God. The Lord is in whatever question you are during the week, whatever kind of uh, confusion you are during the week, as you come on Sunday when the choir is singing, or when our teachers are teaching Sunday, 
the scripture all those questions you had in your mind they are all answered and when the word also comes the passages you have not understood everything is cleared up what other thing do you need again the lord has shown that the lord is with us and then look at the revival going on as we are praying here god is uh, you know reaching us and healing us and delivering us is giving the buying giving them children what other what other a uh, kind of uh, assurance do we need and then we still need somebody to die and go somewhere and come and tell us we don't need all that i said we don't need all that the word of god is very clear it makes everything plain to us and very clear to us and because it's given us this complete assurance we're going to follow it in jesus name look at another thing in the life of this man in the life of gideon we're looking at chapter 6 verse 34 chapter 6 we're looking at verse 34 in verse 34 the first part says and the spirit of the lord came upon gideon that set us everything when the spirit of god comes upon us it is is the spirit that will guide us into all truth. It's not the revelation or the vision of somebody that went somewhere that will guide us into all truth. It is the spirit of God that comes upon our lives that will guide us into all truth. We're looking at John chapter 16. John chapter 16 and I'm reading here from verse 13. John chapter 16 we're looking at verse 13 it tells us in verse 13 how be it when he the spirit of truth has come he will guide you into how much of truth all truth he'll guide us into all truth truth about heaven and truth about salvation and truth about sanctification and truth about holy living truth about how to get to heaven it is the spirit that will guide us into all truth for he shall not speak of himself but whatsoever he shall hear that shall he speak for he will show you things to come and then the response of the people it is very important look at this in judges now judges chapter 6 and i'm reading from verse 34 Look at Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. We're looking at verse 34. It says, But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and Abiezer was gathered after him. Abiezer. Who was Abiezer? And what tribe is that? Which people are that? Look at verse 11. As you look at verse 11, it says, And there came an angel of the Lord, and sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash, the Abiezerite. Those are the people of Joash, the father of Gideon. These were the people a few verses ago and that said, we're going to kill this man. How could he throw down the altar of Baal? They wanted to kill him and then God defended and God protected him when he blew the trumpet. Those were the first people to come out and to, to say, we'll follow you. To say that we submit ourselves to you. That alone should have convinced this man that this call is of God. The people persecuted him before and the people that were opposed to him before, they were the people that now said, we're going to serve with you. We're going to fight this battle with you. That's what the Lord has done for us. I said, that's what the Lord has done for us. Are you hearing the testimony? Some people that say, I will never go to deeper life if that is the only place you go to get to heaven. Let me go where I want to go. I'll never get there. They fought and they persecuted. And then revival is going on now. They have been sick, no healing. And they have been, you know, deranged mentally and no deliverance. And then somebody said, they are having this in that place. And then they got there. As they got there, lo and behold, the first person to get healed, so that's the person to get healed and then they come out they are not even ashamed they are not afraid they said i used to fight against this church before even when i saw the picture of that man the picture was terrifying me and i want to go and ask him what have i done to you this one will fight it out and instead of fighting out now they are submissive and converted their children of god and they are members of the church you know god is telling us that something is happening in our day I said something happening in your day. You will not miss it in Jesus' name. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 14. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 60. We're looking at verse 14. Isaiah chapter 60. We're looking at verse 14. The sons also of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee. 
Are you still there? Something is coming your way. All your enemies, they'll bend before you in Jesus' name. And all that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet. And they shall call thee the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. You see, that's what God did for Gideon. All that should have given him assurance, the response of the people, and the turning of the tribe unto him. The whole tribe, not just says town people all the tribe look at chapter 6 i'm reading from verse 35 chapter 6 we're looking at verse 35 judges chapter 6 verse 35 it says in verse 35 and he sent messengers throughout all manasseh he didn't even go there himself these people that had come to him from abiza he said now you will go to manasseh you'll go to zebulon you will go to naphtali and you will go and invite them he didn't even go by himself it says in that verse 35 and he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh who also was gathered after him and he sent messengers unto Asa and then unto Zebulon and unto Laphtali and they came up to meet him. They all came. They all came to meet him. Manasseh. Who is Manasseh? And what tribe is that of Manasseh? Let's look at verse 15. Verse 15. And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh say and i'm the least in my father's house i'm from the tribe of manasseh and as you look at all the tribe of manasseh my family is the poorest and then i'm the least in the poor family in manasseh and yet when this man gave the call everybody in manasseh they all rushed and they said we are for you we're going to support you all that should give assurance to this man and with all the things that the lord has done we have assurance already i said we have assurance already we're going to win the war we're going to win the battle and the lord is going before us we will not turn back in jesus name now a christian's assessment discerning gideon's fleas that's point number three a christian's assessment discerning gideon's flee. well you've read it already let's look at it together we're looking at a uh, chapter six we're looking at chapter six of judges and i'm reading from verse uh, 36 from verse 36 and gideon said unto god if thou even the way he started that sentence already you know he's taking the wrong step out he's putting the wrong foot out if thou if thou if thou will save israel by my hand as thou hast said as thou hast said i'm not sure you are telling me the truth i'm not sure that you are faithful because I know what you have said. I hear what you have said. I understand what you have said. But if thou, if thou will do this as thou hast said, are you truthful? Will you fulfill your promise? Will you do what you said you will do? If thou, you know, when you see if thou, you see what the Lord responds to that. If thou, let's look at it. Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. If thou, if thou, if thou thou anytime you see that anytime you see anybody saying that to god something is wrong i pray you'll not doubt god you will not question god if god says this is what he's going to do you'll not say if thou if thou in a mark chapter 9 i'm reading from verse 22 mark chapter 9 mark chapter 9 we're looking at verse 22 in verse 22 in verse 22 and of times it has cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him but if thou if thou that's gideon's language and this is what this man said using gideon's language if thou can do anything have compassion on us and help us and jesus returned this if thou back to him look at verse 29 and jesus said unto him if thou if thou if thou you see that's not god's language and when this man used that language towards jesus christ jesus threw it back to him don't use that language for me is the god of all power is the alpha and the omega you don't use if thou for is a faithful god is a covenant keeping god you don't use if thou for him gideon was ignorant you will not be ignorant and so jesus said unto him if thou canst believe all things are possible to him that believeth you'll be a believer in jesus name that shows number one gideon's feebleness gideon's feebleness but then number two is god's faithfulness god's faithfulness there's nothing god cannot do and i want to assure you in your life he will do everything 
I said they will do everything. As you go to God in prayer today, don't never, never say to God, if thou, because we will never question the faithfulness of God. He will do everything in Jesus' name. Uh, come back, come back now to uh, Judges chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 37. Judges chapter 6, verse 37. Behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor. And if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon all the earth beside, then shall I know. Then shall I know. If this happens, then shall I know. What the angel said to me is not enough, but let this happen, then shall I know. What God himself has said to me, I'm with you, that mighty man of valor, that's not enough for me, but if this happens, then shall I know. That's groundless faithlessness groundless faithlessness after god has said what he wanted to say and he has affirmed that this is what he was going to do this happens only then when i know that this is what we are going to do and that's like thomas and all the other disciples when thomas came they said we have seen the lord he's risen from the dead according to what he said he said i'm going to be delivered to the hands of the sinners on the third day i will rise again when you are not around thomas the lord came he appeared unto us thomas said unless i see the print of the nail in his hand that thrust my hand into his side i will not believe the eighth day they were gathered together and thomas was there and jesus came in and without allowing thomas to say anything, he said thomas come in here look at my hand and look at my side and then thomas said my lord and my god he said well now because you see you are walking by side now you believe blessed are those people People that have not seen and yet they believe. The Lord is not going to be praising Gideon because it's like Thomas. When I see this, then I shall know. I don't need to see anything again. He saved me. I feel that in my soul. I know that in my heart. And every promise he has made to me all these many years before deeper life started, since deeper life started, he has fulfilled every word. We know that our God is a faithful God. He's a truthful God. And whatever he said, he will do in Jesus' name. And then I come to another point here. This is a grievous fastidiousness. Fastidiousness is, you know, after you've got this detail, you've got this detail, you've got this detail, you're saying, say, oh God, now for the last time. Don't be angry, don't be angry. He knew that God should be angry with him. He knew that. That's why I said, don't be angry with me. Just this last time now, if the deal will fall on the sides and not on the deal, then I will know. That's Gideon's fastidiousness. And eventually we even see, even after all that, you come to chapter 7 and we'll see Gideon's uh, fearfulness. He was still afraid. Look at chapter 7. In chapter 7, as you look at it from verse 9, in chapter 7 of these uh, judges, and you're looking at uh, verse 9, and it says, and it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, and get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thy hands. I have delivered it into hands. Uh, verse 10, but if thou if thou, if thou, that's Gideon's language, and God is throwing back into it, I know that, now I said I've delivered it into your hand, but I know you are going to be afraid. If thou fear to go down, go thou with Porah, thy servant, down to the host, and thou shalt hear what they say. If what I've said is not enough to give you faith, thou shalt hear what they say. I pray that you'll not go that length. You'll say, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Can we say that together? God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Say that again. For the final time, it will set you into your life. Isaiah chapter 55, I'm looking at verse 11. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11. So shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. The word of God will prosper your life. Every promise of God will prosper in your life. 
every good thing the Lord has told you, they'll be fulfilled in Jesus' name. And as you stand on those promises of God, you will not fall, you will not fail, you will not falter in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. The Lord has given us his word and that word will be fulfilled. Did he say he will save you and your family? He'll save your family and save you. Did he say he will heal you? He will heal you. Did he say he will deliver you? He will deliver you. Did he say you will be a competent, effective, mighty instrument in his hand? You'll be a competent, effective, mighty instrument in the hand of the Lord. He has promised he cannot fail. He has promised you he cannot fail. Don't go back to the lifestyle and the question and the confusion of Gideon. The Lord has given us complete assurance and his word will be yes and amen in every one of our lives. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer.